For the past three weeks, we've been talking about rest. We've been talking about Sabbath. We've been talking about the rest that comes in Jesus. And rest is, again, something that, that often resonates because it feels like it's so hard to get in, in a very restless world, a world that's constantly moving. Um, not only are things happening constantly, but our brains are constantly working. Um, our, our hearts, our souls are constantly searching for things, um, contentment, happiness, all of these things. And so we've spent four weeks now, counting today, um, talking about rest. We, we started three weeks ago talking about the rest that God built into creation. How from the very get-go, God designed the world to have these rhythms. This rhythm of the day, the day for work, the night for rest. This rhythm of the week, six days to work and a, a day to be at rest. And how they foreshadowed the rest that Jesus would give. Um, we talked about the next week, uh, rest is a gift. It's not meant to be legalistic. So if you've been doing our Sabbath challenge, hopefully you're not beating yourself up. Like, man, I checked my phone. <laughs> Um, It's meant to be a gift. It's meant to be helpful, um, but they're not meant to be legalistic. Um, Last week, uh, AJ talked to us about Sabbath as rebellion, the idea that for the people of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament, um, they were forced as slaves to work constantly. And so God's gift of rest was meant to be radically different from the life they had before. And now as Christians, we get to live a life at peace and at rest that looks different from the world around us. Today, we're going to close out this conversation on rest, talking about rest And Sabbath is expectation. This eternal rest, this this rest far greater than simply sitting on a chair for a while or sitting back on the couch. Um, A a rest so great that it's more than just our bodies or our minds, but our very core of who we are. We're going to talk today about how that rest comes to us here and now. And then we're going to preview a little bit of what it'll look like on the last day. So that's what we're doing today. Um, To help us accomplish this, we're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews. Um, The book of Hebrews is a wonderful book. It's basically like a sermon. It just takes what we call the Old Testament, and it takes the the stories of God's dealings with his people and shows how those point to Jesus and what he's done, how he's greater than all those things, and then urges Christians to stay faithful in the midst of all their challenges. And so it it implies a little bit of knowledge, and we'll get there of of what you need to know for this sermon. Um, but Hebrews is where we're going to be looking at chapters 3 and 4. But what I want you to um, listen for is that as we look at this passage in Hebrews 3 and 4, in the midst of a restless world, Jesus is offering us a treasure. Then this author is going to identify a threat to that treasure. And then he's going to offer the treatment to combat the threat. So there's a treasure, there's a threat, but there's a treatment. So that's what we're going to be looking, looking at in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. Now, for this specific passage, what the author of Hebrews is hoping that the readers know, and so I'm going to fill you in on this, is the Old Testament story of God's people Israel as they're walking through the wilderness going to a promised land. So as, as AJ covered last week, God delivered his people from slavery. They're starting to walk through the wilderness, and what he's promised them is, I'm leading you to this good, wonderful, bountiful land. And at that place, you're going to have rest. So right now, you've been, you've been working so hard, you've been laboring, and now you're wandering through the desert, your feet are probably getting sore and tired. But there's a land waiting for you that you're going to, you're going to spread out, it's going to be wonderful, and it's going to be overflowing with good things, and you'll get to rest. It is a land of rest. The problem is the people, they, they get right up to the land, and they send some spies out to see, you know, how's it looking? And the spies come back with this, this bad report. They say, you know, we checked out this, this land that God said. <sighs> There's some strong dudes there. I don't think we can take them. And so the spies come back. All but two of the spies say, hey, this is a bad idea. Let's not go. Like, we're gonna, this is a death sentence. And so these spies say, don't listen to God's voice. Listen to us. We saw, and it's not looking good. And so the people, instead of listening to what God says, they listen to these spies, and they listen to their fear. And because of it, they end up not going to the land. And as punishment for this, God says, you as a generation are not going to get to step onto that land of rest anymore. Instead, you're going to wander through the desert, restless, and your children are going to get the land instead. And so the author of Hebrews is is going to be talking about this story in context of what Jesus is offering his people today. And he's going to start off by quoting Psalm 95, uh, which is a psalm from the King David who's referencing this story. So this is Hebrews chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, They always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, 
they shall not enter my rest. So a couple things to note. First off, just I want to highlight, um, for the author of Hebrews, if it's written in the Old Testament, that's as good as God speaking it. So when we talk about the Bible being God's word, um, that's how the book of Hebrews understands it. Who wrote the psalm? David. But for the Hebrews, author of Hebrews, he's like, yeah, as the Holy Spirit once said, as God once said. And so what David wrote in this psalm, and God spoke through David, is that today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts, because your fathers did it in the wilderness, and they had to wander around for 40 years, and God was mad at that generation. And because of it, they forfeited this land of rest, and God told them, they shall not enter my rest. So the author of Hebrews is quoting this to kind of apply it to the people he's talking to. So then he says this. This is his application. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So the people of Israel, God had done all these mighty things for them. He sent plagues upon their enemies. He helped them in battle. He, helped, he parted a sea. He made water shoot out from a rock. He did all these great things. But they ultimately, when it came time to listen to God, hey, go into this land, they didn't believe him. And so they were unable to enter the land. They were unable to enter that rest. And so this is one of the things that this author is concerned about. He's saying, all right, so notice these people. What happened to them? At the core of it, it was unbelief. They didn't listen to God. They were listening to the voices of the spies. They were listening to the voices of their fear. And so because of it, they did not get to enter this rest, this land of rest. So then he goes on, jumping forward. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. I'm going to pause right there. So for the people of Israel, what was this rest that they were promised? It was a piece of land, right? This promised land. And the author of Hebrews, to people all over the place, is saying, actually, that promise still stands. But notice now, it's no longer a piece of land. It's no longer a territory. But the kingdom, this kingdom of rest, is now non-geographic. So no longer do we need to, to take a certain piece of land, but instead God's kingdom is wherever Jesus is and his people dwell and embody him. So this promise still stands, even though you don't have to go into what's now modern day Israel, Palestine, all of that. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. All right, so fear. So he says, take this seriously. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. So here's what he's saying, is the promise that was made to those people, even though that for them it was geographic, he says that's the same promise that we've gotten. At the core of it, what was the whole point of a promised land? It was a, a place where God's presence was embodied, where his will was done, where people worshipped God, God blessed the people, all of that. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, that was, it's the same promise for us, right? Now, we're not, again, we're not looking for a territory here because Jesus says, this, my kingdom is not of this world, right? It's not, it's not a piece of land, but it's wherever Jesus is. And so that same promise that was given to them is given to us. This is why you can look at the Old Testament figures and say, in a lot of ways, they were Christian. They didn't know the name of Jesus Christ, and yet they were believing the same promise that has been given to us. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. And so he concludes it by saying, we who have believed enter that rest. So in believing these promises, in receiving the gifts of Jesus, you've entered the rest. Now, for those who believe, I'm guessing your life isn't like all beach, pina colada, sunshine. If it is, wow, good for you. That's amazing, right? As the thunder came right at that point. It was like perfect. Like. So what he's getting at here is there's a different kind of rest. For the people, they were, they were looking very much so for a piece of rest that was physical, right? Again, they were, they were slaves. They were walking through the wilderness. Months, years, decades of walking through dry ground. And yet this rest that Jesus promises is something different. It's something greater than this. And so what we see here is the author of Hebrews is, is already highlighting that this rest is a different kind of rest. This is not just life's going to be easy. This is not just I finally get to kick my feet up. This is a rest for the very being of who we are. Because in this world, we are plagued by all sorts of things. We find we're, we're restless in how others think about us, how we fit into the world, how, how do I make sense of who I am, what's my purpose in life, what can make me truly happy. Um, we're constantly searching for things to give us rest. 
And we look for all sorts of things. We, we say, you know, maybe if I just finally got to a certain level of financial security, then, man, I, then I could just really let up. Then I would be able to rest. Man, I have these goals for my life, and if I could just um, get married and have a family, then, oh, then I could just rest. These are good things, but we start searching for rest in all sorts of places. And what Hebrews is saying is that in the promise of Jesus, your soul, your heart actually has true rest. Not just, wait, if you believe in Jesus, one day you'll get rest, but it's here and it's now. This is why Augustine famous, famously wrote in his confession, St. Augustine of Hippo, he wrote this in the book Confessions, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Apart from Jesus, apart from God, your, your heart is going to grab onto things looking for satisfaction, looking for meaning. And it's only in the one who created us, the only in the one who can truly offer rest, that our hearts can be at peace. Now in this world, right, Jesus promises for those who follow him, <laughs> in this world, you'll have troubles. <laughs> what a great word by Jesus. We should put that on like a, in this world you'll have troubles. Like, thank you, Jesus. And yet in the midst of it, it says, fear not because I have overcome the world. So I'm going to face trouble. As a Christian, it's a given. There's going to be trouble in your life. And yet in the midst of that trouble, I can rest because Jesus has overcome the world. And so here's the treasure that Jesus is offering. The treasure is in Jesus, we have an eternal rest of heart and soul every day. It's not a future reality. It's not, hey, one day everything will be good. It's already, here and now, this rest is for you. Like Stephen talked about earlier, we're, or that song we're praying, God, remind us, help us to believe that not only have you done great things in the past through your resurrection, through your mighty acts, but you are the God who continues to work today. And so my soul can be at rest knowing that I don't have to justify myself. I don't have to make myself right or pretend that I'm something that I'm not. I can just be your child and I can rest in that. And then I'm free to go out and do all sorts of things to bless others because I'm not worried about what, how is this going to make me stand before God? Am I going to be better? Is this going to satisfy me? In Jesus, my heart is at rest. That's all I need. He's going to continue on here in Hebrews. For he is somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So here, this is accounting, this is three weeks ago we talked about this in Genesis 1. God worked Six days, and then at the beginning of Genesis 2, it says that God rested from his work on the seventh day. So the author of Hebrews is recalling this, this rest, just as God rested on the seventh day. But here's how he applies it. Since therefore it remains for some to enter in it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day. Which day? Today. Notice that, just pause right there. So, in the beginning, God worked for six days, and then on the seventh day, he rested. So that was the Holy Sabbath day. For the Christian, which day is the Holy Sabbath day? Today. And if you asked me tomorrow, it would be today. And the next day? Today. That this rest, he continues on, saying, Through David so long afterwards, and the word already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And so the gift of Sabbath, the gift of rest, again, is not just a future promise. It's not just a once in a while. But it's now. Whenever you ask the question, it's right now. Jesus is offering his rest. So this is the promise that, that it's not just one day a week. For the Christian, this is where, again, um, having physical rest, and, and I hope, again, I hope you try the Sabbath challenge, but ultimately that's not about, um, like, your life's going to be better if you take this, this time of mental and physical rest because the rest that Jesus offers is actually an everyday reality. It's coming to him and receiving the rest that only he can give. Again, it's good to give our bodies rest. It's good to give our brains a rest, trust me. Um, but this promise is so much greater, a rest for our hearts. And this is where he's going to compare the rest Jesus gives to the old rest. So Joshua is the one who led them into the promised land. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered, entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his so he highlights even the people who did get into that promised land, it didn't last, right? They disobeyed God, they rejected him, and, and the rest of that land ultimately became restless. War broke out, divisions, factions, exile, all sorts of terrible things. So that rest couldn't last, and yet now there remains a far greater rest, a Sabbath rest for the people of God, 
And whoever has entered into this rest through faith has also rested from his works as God did from his. So just as God worked for six days and then rested on the seventh day, in Jesus, you no longer have to work to be good enough for God. You no longer have to work to say, you know what, I just got to do a little bit more and then I'll be a good person. In Jesus, it's just God says, hey, in me, you're right. You're good. You're righteous. Not because you're, you're awesome, but because I love you so much and I'm giving you my righteousness. And sure, he's going to do things. He's going to help you. He's going to give you his Holy Spirit to sanctify you and make you more holy. But the fundamental thing is I no longer have to work in my standing before God because I get to rest from that. And I'm free. I'm free to go in this world and say, man, how could God use me? I'm not worried about this or that. I can just love and care. And I'm free to then rest and trust that God's got things under control. So then he's going to wrap up this section by saying this. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Okay, so here's a funny thing. I love this juxtaposition. Strive, work hard to enter that rest. So wait, so you're supposed to work hard or you're supposed to rest, right? Am I striving or am I resting? Yes, <laughs> it's a both. Here's where we're going to get into the thread of all this, right? Because this is one of the great gifts. And we saw Andrew receive this and everyone who is baptized and believes receives this gift of rest, freely given. God just says, I want you to have this. Great. And yet, what the author of Hebrews is pointing out here is that to, to enter that and to stay in it can sometimes take some work. And here's why. This is a little bit earlier in this section. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 14 Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So what's he say? He says, take care, right? This is the, the fear part. This is the striving part. Lest there be in you an evil, unbelieving heart that leads you astray because of, jumping down, the deceitfulness of sin. The deceitfulness of sin. And so here's the threat. The treasure is this rest that comes in Jesus for our heart and for our souls. Sin will try and deceive us into walking away from this rest. And this is subtle, right? Deception is never blatant obvious. Um, you don't deceive somebody by saying, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ruin your life, right? Um, it's tricky. It's subtle sometimes. And, and often when you think about it, like why would anyone walk away from a good thing? But, but functionally, we know this all the time. There's all sorts of things that we know we should do that we tend not to do. Other things are, are easier or sometimes they seem better. Right? Often we don't function on what is good but what seems good, what feels good, what looks good. This is the very beginning. So, so Eve is in the garden and the snake comes up and says, hey, you know that fruit? God said don't eat that. So is it good to eat the fruit? No. Look at that fruit, and you can be like God. Well, being like God seems good. And, and it says, too, that the fruit looked good for eating. It, it looked tasty. Like, oh. And so she disobeyed. She listened to what seemed good, what looked good, instead of what was good. And in doing so, her and Adam helped bring sin into the world. And so in today's world, again, there, there's things that look good, that seem good, right? So is it a good thing to be happy? Yeah. Is it a good thing to have a meaningful job? Yeah. But what sin can do is it can deceive you into thinking that that, that is the ultimate good. That, that if, I could just, if I could just have that job, then things would be good. And so, you know, I might, I might lie a little bit to get it, but it's for this good thing, right, this job. Or if you're, if you're hoping for a husband or a wife or a kid, are those good things? Yes. But what sin can do is it can deceive you. It's like, hey, that would be really great. And so whatever means it takes to get those, don't worry about what God says. Just, just try and get those because those are a good thing. Right? Pleasures, happiness, all sorts of things. Hey, that, that seems really good. Sin is going to deceive us by holding up what is good and say this is the ultimate good. And so what ends up happening is we start to listen to the voice not of God, but of the voice of our fears, our wants, the voice of the world around us. And here's the danger. Here's why it's such a threat. Have you ever tried to be in two conversations at once? You can't listen to both. And so all of a sudden what ends up happening is you end up tuning one out to talk to the one and you come back, and you're like, what, what was that? Oh, yeah, yeah, you just nod, right? And just kind of chuckle along or something. I don't know if you've ever had the moment where you've laughed at something, you realize it was not supposed to be funny. Um, I've, I've been there. What ends up happening is when you start to listen to the voice of, of sin and all these other voices, you naturally start to tune out God's voice. 
You naturally start to, to listen to these voices and the rest of their promising, these things, and I'm no longer in tune with the one voice that can actually give me rest. And so what you're doing is you're basically forfeiting the rest that Jesus is offering. You're just walking away from it. The people of Israel, they were standing there on the border. There's this promised land. You're like, you know what? I'm going to listen to the voice that says to go this way. God just said, hey, just come on with me. I'll, I'll make it good. And they said, no, I think I'll go that way. And so the threat that the author of the Hebrews is worried about is that there's this, this wonderful rest for your soul, for your heart, this eternal rest that you can have right now. Don't start listening to other voices. Now, this doesn't mean you don't talk to people. Don't, you live in this world. But when it comes to your heart, what voices are you giving access to? What voices am I letting speak to me? Is it just the voices of my friends, just the voices of um, my favorite personality that I follow? Is it just the voices of my desires? Or is it the voice of God? Because that voice can easily lead us to tune out God and walk away from the rest. This is what the Hebrews author is saying. Just like those people didn't listen, we all run the risk of tuning God out, disobeying and walking away. And he doesn't want us to lose that rest. So that's the threat. But then we're going to close up by talking about the treatment. So if the treasure is this eternal rest for you right now in Jesus, the threat is that sin is going to deceive us to listening to the wrong voices. Here's the solution. Notice here, this is what we just read, but I'm going to jump to verse 13. So how do we take care, lest there be in us an unbelieving evil heart? Exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today. I love this. So when is the Sabbath for the Christian? Today, right? And then when should we be exhorting one another? When should we be speaking with one another as Christians about the word of God, about his love for us, his grace, his promises, his commands? Any day that's called today. Every day. It's just, a, it's just a reality. This is how you take care. This is how you are on guard. Because if there's all sorts of voices, then we need to make sure that the most prominent, strongest voice in our lives is the voice of God. And he's given us brothers and sisters in the faith to speak it to one another, to remind one another, to celebrate with one another. And then he closes out the section talking about how powerful this word is of God. He says this, For the word of God is living and active. So when you speak for God, it, it's, it's alive. It does stuff. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So God's word, it's, it's living. It, it has the ability, when you hear God's word, to cut to the very heart of things. Those unbelieving hearts that, that we are so prone to, to foster all of a sudden, it's cut into pieces. and can be discerned and divided. This word is so powerful. And so the solution to this threat is that the word of God is what brings us into and keeps us in Christ's rest. This is why next week we're talking about meditation and meditating on God's word. But this is something we need all the time. It's why Sunday, which for the Christian church is kind of like our communal Sabbath as a whole body, is filled with God's word. I don't know if you've noticed this, right? So we... we Right now, we're talking about God's word. We sing songs based on God's word, proclaiming God's word to one another. We pray with language of God's word. We do the creed, which is just confessing what God has done in his word. And so we spend this time just saturating ourselves with the word because it's that word that keeps us in his rest. That word that brings us into faith and trust. In a world with all sorts of noise and distractions, this is the word it says, here is rest. And so we saturate ourselves. We fill our ears with it. This is why Martin Luther called the church a mouth house. <laughs> it's just a house full of mouths talking about God's word. It's filled speaking to one another. And so this treasure that Jesus is offering everyone is that in him, true rest. Rest for your heart, rest for your soul. That even as storms whirl around us, I think it's like we plan this, even as storms whirl outside in our hearts, there can be rest. The threat is that voices in this world are going to deceive us to walk away. But the solution God offers is take my word, take my promises to keep you in this rest. So we might take this confidence that we have and endure to the end. And it's just a preview of, of what this rest is because we have this rest now, but this is a rest that we're going to see fully realized in the last day. That what we see kind of dimly now is going to be even more realized. I want to give you a picture of what that looks like. When Jesus returns, this is the prophet Micah talking about this last day, what God is going to do. 
Micah chapter 4, he shall judge between many peoples. He is God, or Jesus actually, the Savior. And shall decide disputes for strong nations far away. And notice this, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Don't you love that? Nobody's going to have to, the art of war, by Sun Tzu, no more. You don't even have to learn war. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. So the picture that God gives us is that on the last day when Jesus returns, everything's going to be good. There's no more war. There's no more things happening far away or near. You just get to, I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments, where just, things feel right. We get little glimpses of it in this lifetime. So the picture he's giving here is you're sitting under a tree. Maybe the sun's shining. There's a soft breeze. And there's no fear. There's no worry of when this is going to end. This can't last very long. Everything is just peaceful and at rest. And sure, we'll be doing things. We'll be working. We'll be gardening. We'll be hanging out with one another. But everything will feel truly restful. That's what's happening when Jesus returns. And the radical news of Jesus is that in his death and resurrection, in the most restless occasion possible, where his body is being torn as people are shouting mocks, mockeries at him. He took on the flurry of restlessness of, and sin and death so that way that eternal rest, this kind of rest, could be yours right now. May that rest hold you firm in his promises for now until he returns. We get to sit under that fig tree and enjoy the fruits. In Jesus' name, amen.